you may not have optimal genes, but you can control expressions in different ways. And, but it's not that simple. Um, gene expression is, is omnigenic. I mean, every gene in the human genome is in some way contributing to an outcome. So even though, you know, you have one base pair, you know, MTHFR is one base pair out of 3 billion. And to think that that has that big of an impact, it's not a mutation. I mean, this is a variant, this is a polymorphism. And it is not going to be that impactful if you match lifestyle to that. And, you know, this is the epigenetic piece. This is where we actually can manipulate the expression of the genome. You know, the genetics is the, the hardware of the individual. So we, we truly have a, a blueprint of the hardware of that individual. But you've got this overlay of epigenetics, which is really what controls the expressions of those genes. So you may not have optimal genes, but you can control expressions in different ways. And, but it's not that simple. Um, gene expression is, is omnigenic. I mean, every gene in the human genome is in some way contributing to an outcome. So even though, you know, you have one base pair, you know, MTHFR is one base pair out of 3 billion. And to think that that has that big of an impact, it's not a mutation. I mean, this is a variant, this is a polymorphism. And it is not going to be that impactful if you match lifestyle to that. And, you know, this is the epigenetic piece. This is where we actually can manipulate the expression of the genome. It's very cool stuff. Now, what, how do we change the, uh, the gene expression? We have to look at every aspect of our lifestyle as some type of, of an input into the system. I mean, even foods, foods are bioactive molecules. They're not just nutrients. Right. You know, every food we consume has some kind of biological effect in the body. I mean, like, like olive oil. I mean, you look at the, the impact of olive oil on gene expressions. It's, it's astronomical. I mean, it, I call it the nectar of the gods because it's so impactful, not only from the, the monounsaturated fat, but the phytonutrients that are in there will change gene expression. Um, Omega-3s, I mean, you hear the article that says, oh, they're useless. And then another article that says they're great for you and healthy. That's the trouble with nutritional studies is that yeah. we, we are not a monoclonal species. You know, the, the rats in the lab are monoclonal. They're, they're all identical genetically speaking and they you can test them and control dietary patterns and see outcomes so you can get suggestions with that but when it comes to humans trying to do a nutritional study is almost impossible because you we're dealing with completely different genomes in in every individual we we have different lifestyle patterns in every individual that are going to impact expression so what i look at is what do, what do omega-3s do to gene expression rather than, you know, looking at the necessarily, I mean, outcome data is nice to inform, but, you know, somebody who's sitting on a couch eating Big Macs and potato chips, uh, taking fish oil isn't going to do anything for them, but a healthy individual taking them probably will. And you look at the gene expression changes and the, the metabolic gene upregulation of omega-3s, the pro-inflammatory downregulation that you get with omega-3s. That's enough to convince me to say, yes, this is a, this is a good adjunct to a healthy lifestyle. And that's nutritionally. What, what about, say, more of the regenerative field like uh, exosomes and stem cells and peptides. What about that area? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, exosomes are the coolest thing. You know, the, one of the fascinating areas for me is microRNA and exosomes are filled with microRNA. They're like emails that they get into the body and, and get sent all around and they inform cells of what's happening in the environment and inform them how to adjust expression. And when you get like, like young exosomes, I mean, it's informing, hey, you know, we're, we're youthful, let's, let's promote youthful expression and all of this. I mean, take breast milk as an example. I mean, breast milk 
has the richest, it's the richest body fluid in microRNAs through the exosomes in the breast milk. And what it's doing is it's informing the child of the environment that it's coming into. So the mother is exposed to the environment and then passing those messages on to the DNA of the child. What does that say to people who drink cow's milk? Let's just say you take a feedlot cow that is highly stressed Mm -hmm. And there, the meat from that cow is, or the milk from that cow is going to have messages of this environment is a very unfriendly, stress-filled environment. You need to prepare for that. So they're getting the message of the microRNAs from those animals to say, hey, uh, change your expression because this is a rough, rough world out here. Now, peptides have been around for quite a while, but they're gaining popularity currently. You know, peptides are interesting in the fact that they are, they're biologics and they are truly um, on target with what they do. You know, we've never had anything as, as precise as what we can get with, with peptides. And, you know, peptides are, are in, in my opinion, safer than, than supplements and medications, because with those, you've got the on target effect plus the off target effect. Whereas with peptides, it's pretty much on target. Uh, there's very little off target um, effects when you're, when you're dealing with peptides. Sorry for the interruption again. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allographs, exosomes, supplements, legal help, or how to create a million dollar business card and dominate your area. We're here to help you. Just text your name and any question to Five six one nine six two one two three one. Write that down. That's five six one nine six two one two three one. Or go to our website at drrosscarter.com to learn more. On with the show. What about senescent cells that cause uh, chronic inflammation? Uh, yeah, I, I love senolytics. Uh, I think this is, you know, it is spectacular. I mean, we've got all these different senolytics and, and, you know, there's not going to be one magic senolytic that's going to target all of these senescent cells at one time. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be selecting cell specific cell type specific uh, or cell line specific um, senolytics, but you also don't want to be taking these senolytics on a daily basis. You want to do hit and run approaches with senolytics and you want to vary them throughout the year. What about something like um, uh, metformin or um, what's the other one called? Uh, rapamycin. Rapamycin. Yeah. 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 Uh, those definitely have a role in age rejuvenation as well. Um, metformin is one of those ones that, you know, you see a lot of pros and cons lately. Um, you see the the articles that say, well, you shouldn't be on metformin if you're trying to gain muscle because you can. It's going to cause mTOR suppression, and you're not going to be able to build muscle. And there's been a couple studies on that. And you know, for me, I look at the the net outcome. So you can look at the individual pieces of pros and cons. So you look at the net effect of it, and what we see with metformin is it's it's pretty well established that it is a longevity uh, medication. And so for me, I look at it and most of our clients are on testosterone or growth hormone, releasing hormones. So muscle mass is not an issue for them. It's, they're able to maintain very easily on the metformin because their anabolic hormones are well managed as well. Um, now, rapamycin, rapamycin is really interesting. Um, you know, it's an immunosuppressant, so you have to be careful with it and you have to do it in the right doses and right. the right time frames. But I think it's highly effective. Let's say a doctor has a practice and is getting involved in this industry and in the anti-aging wellness uh, regenerative field. They're like, where do I start? You know, it's, it's one thing to read it and, and understand it. It's another thing to be able to put it together in a comprehensive profile. You know, that was one of the conversations that we've had. You know, how do we know that the timing on these is, is the correct timing from the senolytics to the rapamycin to the metformin? And the answer is we don't know right now. Uh, we can guess and say, you know, this seems like the right way to do it. With us, I mean, we're on, we're on video calls with every one of our clients once a month. So we're able to kind of get an uh, established picture of 
what's happening and transitioning over time. So it's giving us a little bit more information, but right now we just don't have a good answer of the, the combinations and how to use them. And I tell people, you know, we're using things that don't have a lot of human trials, especially in the areas where we're, we're approaching this. You know, a lot of it is anecdotal experiences that we're going by. We, we look at the human safety studies on this stuff. But when, we, when we're using these for age rejuvenation, I mean, you're truly uh, almost an N of one with this stuff. And um, you can wait around for the longitudinal studies to come out, but most of us will be dead by that time.